you're here and hope this is beginning to be at least a profitable study, I want to emphasize again that there's no way you can fathom deity. You can learn about deity. You can know more than you know now about deity. But by the very nature of deity, you're not going to learn all you would like to learn. Some things just simply make your mind close down because it's higher and beyond all that's human. I want to emphasize a few things we have the last two weeks. <clears throat> Remember, we're talking about the one essence that is the one deity. And when we mention essence, we're talking about the nature of God. To speak of God, to speak of the one essence. Now, we have a human essence, and we can have three people who are in agreement as much as three people can be agreed to anything. But that's not the same type of unity or oneness that belongs to the one divine essence. Uh, when he appeared to uh, Moses in the burning bush, God did, uh, he simply told him, I am that I am. Have you ever wondered what went on in Moses' mind when he heard that? I am that I am. Well, he knew from his mother, nobody else, exactly the things regarding creation, the development of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all those. He knew of the one God, but what kind of an answer is I am? Well, it means he's, he is one being. When you say the divine essence, you're talking about the one being. But to say the one being is to say what? To discuss God is uh, to discuss his essence, from which flows his nature, out of which comes the way we really know him as much as we can by his divine attributes. We haven't got to those yet, but we will. I'm just rehashing right now. Um, we cannot define God because to define him, he said this the first class, is to limit God. Now, that doesn't mean you can't understand something about him, but notice when you study your Bible about God, how many times, how many places does he use terminology that is very familiar with us? And we talked about anthropomorphisms, where he um, says, I can see, or the, in the eyes of God, or the arm of God. Of course, God doesn't have those things like we do, as he created us. But it's a way to speak to us on our own level of understanding. And that's the best way I can put what we're trying to do in this study of the Word of God, it was revealed to give us understanding, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. But even understanding doesn't mean we understand all there is to understand about something. We said also for two reasons, one, our finite ability to understand, the other, that God hasn't revealed all there is to reveal about him. And thus we fall back on Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to God, and the things revealed belong to us and our children forever. We need to focus on the things that are revealed. Now, remember, we can in a general way, and I underscore the word general, through nature understand things about God and probably understand a lot more than we think we would, but you'll never understand the will of God for man by contemplating nature. So the best way is by revelation. God revealed himself to us through revelation, and he reveals his will for how we should live in his words. Again, I cite 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, why we should study the Bible, 2 Timothy 2, 15. Another thing we want to reiterate and emphasize is that we must not think of God as a human, though he uses anthropomorphisms to help us understand him. Um, God is spirit, John 4, 24. He is, in the sense that his, um, we speak of God as his essence, deity, the one divine essence, that he is without beginning or ending. He's not made, and thus anything that is made cannot properly and completely represent him as we try to illustrate him or try to get a better understanding of him. And you will see because he is spirit, starting back in the beginning of the Bible and man's dealing with God, he does not want men have any images, 
material images. Thus, idolatry has always been condemned. And that gets us into the fact that uh, he created our spirits. And, you know, I've never seen my spirit. You've never seen your spirit. And yet the Bible, God's revelation, he who put us together and made us. The Bible tells us plainly that we're made in his image. But that's not the physical image. Doesn't mean God didn't have anything to do with our physical image. We know that for he took dust and fashioned man out of it. And he took uh, the rib and fashioned a woman out of it. Uh, yet what is dwelling in this body for a while is the eternal part of us. I shouldn't say eternal is the immortal part of us because we had a beginning. Eternal, eternal means you don't have a beginning. You can be in eternity, but it never had a beginning. The Lord willing, uh, we'll be in heaven in eternity in a resurrected, glorified body with God forevermore. Now, there is that spirit. When Christ died, he promised the thief that repented, Verily I say unto thee today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. It shows you that uh, there is a consciousness about the spirit after death, because if he wasn't conscious after he died, how would he know who was with him or if anybody was with him? But Jesus said, you will be with me uh, today. So the spirit is something I know I have, and I know it's the real me, as Paul says, the inward man, but I, I've never seen it. I accept the word of God who created me that it's there and that it's fashioned in the likeness of God. Um, so when we speak of God being spirit, we need to know that we can't find among material created things anything that properly represents him. And yet God tries to uh, speak on our level as he made us. He doesn't try to communicate with us in a way that he didn't make us to, to be communicated with. So he communicates on our level, and that's sufficient uh, for us to understand enough about him and what we're to do here to live our lives in a pleasing way to him, a faithful life, and go to heaven. Um, again, I emphasize, you'll see throughout scriptures, and I did this last week, these anthropomorphisms. Uh, when the psalmist writes in Psalm 139, verse 16, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. Whose eyes? God saw it. Uh, well, again, we think of how we see, but God's not a physical being. He's not a material being, and yet he sees. Uh, how would you describe God's awareness of things except by using those things whereby we are aware of things and thereby we have an understanding? We speak of the all-seeing eye of God. We sing a song. There's an all-seeing eye watching you. Tell you, you don't see a big eyeball in the sky looking at you. That's ridiculous. But it means that there's nothing goes on that God is not fully aware or he sees it. What better way to express that particular matter? Uh, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, Proverbs 15 and verse 3. So because uh, he is spirit, we dare not think of him in a way that is material. And you see people always trying to come up with some material thing that represents God. When you get uh, among Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholics or the Eastern Orthodox Church, especially Eastern Orthodox Church, they're big on icons. And if you've ever been around or been in one of those uh, church buildings, you'll see them all over the place. And if you stay there long enough, if people come through, they'll be bowing before them and crossing themselves and all that kind of thing. Um, but God wants us through the knowledge of the word of God to think of him, to be mindful of him, uh, to hold him in our minds as his word reveals him to us. And that doesn't mean we're trying to draw some sort of picture. It just means we take what the Bible says about God. God is love. God is justice, uh, and we think about that. Now, we do have something that helps us when it comes to commemorating the death of Jesus Christ, as the New Testament teaches is 
part of our faithful worship of God on the first day of the week. But notice how simple it is. It's simply the bread that's unleavened and the fruit of the vine. And they're emblematic. He makes it clear when he institutes the Lord's Supper that they're emblematic. And thus, the bread nowhere looks like a dead body. And the fruit of the vine is certainly not like blood. Yet, what are we to do? Well, we think about the body of Christ offered as a sacrifice for us. And we think about the blood of Christ. Um, so, as far as I know, that's about it when it comes to um, things of material nature that is used. Uh, our mind then is to contemplate God as the one. I'll refer to Isaiah here for several scriptures. As the one who sits above the circle of the earth, Isaiah 40, verse 22. As the one uh, living in a high and holy place, but also with him who has a contrite and humble heart, 57, Isaiah 57 and verse 15. He is as the one who knows that the nations are as a drop of the bucket and who counts them as the small dust on the scales, chapter 40 of Isaiah and verse 15. As the one who brings out the starry host one by one, calling them all by name, verse 26. As the one who makes all things who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth, chapter 44 and verse 24, and is the one who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go, 48, verse 17. Now, if you think of every one of those other passages like them, you get a concept in your mind of a person. Now, I want to emphasize that, concept of a person. We'll say more about that later, but... Uh, and and you understand how far above he is as far as we're concerned, how far above he is when it comes to anything that is made. And even spirit beings such as angels, is uh, he's far above them because they're created. They're just created a little higher than man. We're created a little lower than them. We have our specific reason for existing and or he has for us a specific reason for existing as he does the angels. And you'll remember at the temptation of Jesus that uh, Satan told him to bow down and serve him. Jesus answered with scripture and said, it's written, thou shalt serve the Lord thy God and him only. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only thou shalt serve. Well, that's uh, the second person of the Godhead incarnate speaking to a spirit being who having a free will somewhere some sometime, as far as the eternity is concerned, that's the best I can refer, refer to it. Some point in eternity, uh, chose to be the father of lies and oppose God and the truth that flows from God. Um, so we want to be sure that we work, do all we can to learn to shape things on the level of the spirit. I guess. Something that grows on me over all the years in studying this is that God is, if we will love and keep his commandments, transitioning us from living on the plane of the appetites of a physical body in a material world to living on the spiritual plane. Now, you can't see this. In fact, nobody can be sure except by the context, but many times, when we see the word spirit used in the New Testament, uh, it's talking about the spirit of a human being. Other times, it's talking about the Holy Spirit, the third person of God in it. But if you can't, the, let me say it this way. The only way you're going to be able to tell whether spirit is on a spiritual plane or, or a spirit of a man or speaking specifically of the Holy Spirit, is by the context of, of where those words are found. You say, yeah, but I look at the capital letter, and that means Holy Spirit doesn't. There's no capital letters like that in the Greek language. Uh, translators sometimes try to help, and they think this passage context means God or the Holy Spirit. They'll capitalize 
S in the word spirit, like you think it's speaking of the third person out here. Well, there's some that works most of the time or a lot of the time, but it doesn't always work. So you can't always determine that it's speaking of the Holy Spirit just because the word spirit has the S capitalized. Most of the time you can, but a lot of times you can't. But it's always going to be determined by what is being talked about, who's speaking, who's being spoken to, and so forth, the context wherein the word is found. So keep that in the back of your mind when you're studying. And uh, it doesn't pose a great big problem, but when you're speaking of us following the teaching of the authority of Christ in the New Testament, remember it's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. It's the instrument the Holy Spirit uses to convict us of sin, convert us to Christ, and to keep us faithful. We must remember that um, we're guided by that word to live on a different plane from people who are not converted to Christ. When Jesus said, by their fruits, ye shall know them. That evidence is right there, that people who love the Lord and keep his commandments are people who are living differently from those who live on the plane of the material or the fleshly, the appetites of the flesh being what guides them, not the view that we get from following the teaching of the Bible. So if I want to understand spiritual things, if I want to understand the spiritual plane, then I need to not let my mind uh, be wedded to the fleshly or to the material or to the physical. The Word of God lifts us above the physical. And really what's happening is that we, as having become Christian, we're learning to live on the plane where God resides. We're learning to live on the plane of the Father of our spirits, as the writer of Hebrews described the Father of our spirits. So we have earthly fathers and mothers who gave us our fleshly bodies, but only God gave us our inward man or spirit, or sometimes called the heart. So think about life in the flesh as God saying, will you live on the plane of the physical and the material, or will you choose to live on the plane of the spiritual? Thus seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things you've added unto you. So when you think of our study of God, then don't bring him down to an idol or think of him as a material thing. And above all, don't think of him as a man. God is not a man that he should lie. He is not moved by the things that move us. God is a God of justice. He's a God of truth. He's a God of love. Um, None of the things that move people for the most part are the, are the things that move God. If we could just realize uh, something about that, we might have a little bit of an understanding when we leave this body and go into the Hadean world, uh, there won't be any of the desires that govern most men from birth to death because we're freed of all those human desires. And I'll say again, uh, probably one of the best ways to try to understand that is when Jesus spoke of marriage and said, there will be no giving or taking of marriage in the resurrection, but we'll be as the angels of heaven. So now you fathom that. You want to talk about fathoming God and how it's impossible to do so. We'll try to try to figure that. So there are a lot of things, not just God, that makes it difficult for us to get our head around. Uh, to exist as spirit, to be spirit, and we'll say capital S, is the greatest existence or being possible of which there cannot be any greater. So we need to be trying to form that, that view in our mind. Now, let me show you how that works for we're to worship God in spirit and in truth. When you read that Jesus said, our worship is only acceptable to him when we worship him in spirit, and in truth, well, he's not talking about the Holy Spirit. But what's he talking about when he says worship in spirit? Well, we usually say, well, it comes from the heart. 
Well, that's right. But what am I saying when it comes from the heart? Well, it comes from the mind. Well, what am I saying when it comes from the mind? I'm saying it comes from the spirit of you, the inward man, the heart. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's why mind comes up. When I study, there's more than a brain working. The mind, no doubt, of the spirit is connected in some way to the physical body, to the brain. But we're talking about that which is going to transcend our physical being. You remember when Abraham was speaking to the uh, uh, the rich man who died and, and lifted up his eyes being in torments. He's in the place of departed spirits before the world ends. Lazarus was in paradise where Jesus went when he died, and he's with Abraham. And the rich man, representing people who are lost, is in what in Greek is called Tartarus, the place of torment. You know, it says he lifted up his eyes being in torment. Well, he was. There was no fleshly body. He was not, a, he was not anywhere that is material. There was no time. Now, you explain where he was as far as trying to understand it, since we're wedded so much to time and space and material things, that those things don't govern him. But look what he took with him. Abraham says to him, son, remember that thou in thy lifetime had us all good things, Lazarus evil things. Now, he's comforted in thy torment. Well, it's obvious then that the same man that lived in a fleshly body on this earth and neglected God and everything pertained to God is the same man that now suffers in spirit, in his own spirit, his own inward man is still the same in character and attitude and uh, all that. Well, now you explain to me how it works. I don't know, but I accept the fact of it. Let me emphasize that right there. While I can't fully fathom and understand, I can accept the fact of things. I often refer to electricity. People use electricity. They're electric electrical engineers, there are people with PhDs in that area, but they still don't really know what electricity is. There are a number of things like that, but they can use it. And they do because there are certain laws about it. They learn those laws. They, uh, they know it. Uh, it doesn't take but one time to get a pretty good shock from electricity if you know that you don't do certain things with that. Well, now tell me what happened. <laughs> so, so when you get down then to being able to mathematically show all these formulas and all this kind of thing, fine, that's just describing laws. Let, let me make this clear. A law never invented anything. I see these uh, scientists, the PhDs in various fields, and physicists and biologists and all that kind of thing, and I see all these PhD mathematicians, and they work on all this stuff, and they're brilliant minds. Nobody will question that. But they can figure out all the laws they want to and mathematically show them. And let me show you what I can do. I know there's a law that said one plus one equals two. Now, what did that ever invent? What did that ever create? Nothing. <laughs> and you can take all the laws there are and write them in however many formulas you want to write them. And they're never going to create anything. So we need to understand that you can learn things even about this physical world and people have, they've delved deeply into it and they've been able to see how things work and they've learned some things they thought was right. Later on through further investigation in science, they found it wasn't and all that kind of thing or they've had to adjust them. But none of that's made any of it. You know, I, I don't know how far back when it comes to treating appendicitis, it was that doctors learned that you could remove an infected appendix, uh, appendix and, and cure somebody. But I can tell you that before they ever learned that, that appendix was uh, getting infected and killing people. And it took a while for things to develop to where they had the knowledge and wherewithal technology to be able to know to remove the thing. Well, if you could have removed it, hundred years before they found out you could remove it, that would have worked, but they couldn't. That's the way it is with all science. We discover what God put here when he made this place. Well, God's saying, I'm going to do away with it when it's fulfilled its purpose. So how do you get ready to live on the plane of God? Well, God shows himself to us. First of all, 
in general ways in nature, but mainly, as I said, I think the first night, maybe it was last week, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You'll see how God would live if he were a human in a sinful world. Now, why did he do that? Well, it wasn't for his benefit. It was for our benefit. That they ought to begin to tell us that he wants us to live on a certain plane and not the plane that's going to be burned up with fervent heat someday, but the plane that fits you for eternity. Now, that's one reason I like to study about God as much as I can, because he's my father. He fathered my spirit, and he's trying to get me ready to live where I can be in his very presence. So I want to study what he's revealed to me in his word about God. So I will say again, uh, as we understand God, you'll see that he'll talk about anger, his anger. He'll talk about his love, and all those things. Uh, but yet it's still hard to fathom that kind of thing. Uh, the, I guess we can talk about it in the sense of what we would use to describe our human nature. Um, talk about our passions. Now, people may not want to apply that to God, but if he uses human things to communicate with us so we can better understand him on our finite level, then we can talk about the passions of God. When Jesus was on earth, John 11, 35, says that Jesus as a man wept. And um, that should cause us to realize he's empathetic and he's sympathetic and he loves people. John 5, 13 talks about him uh, having joy. Um, he remembered his former glory, and you remember we said already about this, he prayed in the garden that he be glorified with the glory he had with the Father before the world was. Matthew uh, 27, 46. He had righteous zeal, John records in John 2, in verse 17. So there's a many things that we see displayed in human form of Jesus. Yet we know he didn't go against his divine being as he did so. I've tried to, this is my own thinking, but I know we read it last week that Paul in encouraging Christians to follow the humble example of Christ and submitting their will to God and living like they ought to, talked about Jesus giving up a form of deity. And I emphasize quickly, he's not talking about giving up deity. You don't do that. It's impossible in the way that deity is. Deity just is. But evidently, there's a form. I don't know what it is. But there's a form of deity. And he gave that up and took upon himself the form we have. That doesn't mean just a body, but he became a human. I don't understand all about that. But I know it meant that he stepped down. That's obvious. That's the very point of the passage of Philippians that Paul is making to Christians in that we should follow his example. Well, when I think about that, I realize that he loved us so much, he came to earth to live just like we would, show us the way to heaven through the way he lived, and Peter could write that we should follow in his steps, which steps are set out in the New Testament of Christ. And thus, we learn to live on the level of, of the spirit and not on the level of the flesh. So he's lifting us up from the form we presently have so that we can graduate into eternity when the end of time comes, the judgment's passed, and, and our glorified bodies were able to walk in the very presence, the presence of the Father and the Holy Spirit and all the angels and all the worthies that have ever served God on this earth. And that ought to make us realize why we ought to study the Bible more just to say, well, what or who is God? I'm headed that way if I'm a Christian. Uh, he's given me everything to help me be like him. He even says in way of hope, as John said, and I've mentioned it many, many times, we do not know what we shall be like, but we shall be like him when we see him as he is. And we're promised, as Paul discussed it, the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, we're sown in corruption, we're raised in incorruption. This is surely is there uh, different types of glory, but then there is a glory of things here, as he talks about the stars, the moon, sun. 
yet there's glory of other things. So what does all this do? Why study about God? Why are we looking at the eternal essence? Why are we looking at the word of God telling us about him? Because we, that encourages us to live more on his level. Now, that gets me down to this point, and I left out several things there when I talked about various passions of, of God, but they're there. You, you think of the fact that he suffered that says something, what he was willing to do, and all those things. But this brings us down to this. This one divine essence made of three persons, we seldom got to discussion of the Trinity, but I'll say that now, that he's personal. God is personal. When we talk about having faith in Jesus Christ, sometimes I don't think we let it sink in like it ought to, that we're talking about an actual person. We're not just talking about doctrine. We're not just talking about, well, you must believe, repent, confess, be baptized. Uh, you must study your Bible every day. We're doing all that because God is personal. How personal is he? I just think of Jesus Christ. I read a thing so many years ago. It was up north, and they were having a terrible winter. And it had snowed and snowed and snowed, and uh, the birds and the animals were having a hard time finding anything to eat. Of course, you know, people have always fed things like that in their yard. And sometimes we may see it where it's got so bad that they, the Game and Fish Commissions have had to haul out food to feed the deer and stuff like that. But this man who was not a Christian, was home one Sunday morning, his wife was, and she had gone to worship. And it had been weather like this below zero for a long time. And he could see a flock of birds outside the back patio doing their best to try to find something to eat. And uh, he said, I would just like to help them, but every time I'll do fly off. And uh, he decided in his mind, he said, well, they probably wouldn't run from me, be so frightened of me. I could just become a bird and they would understand me and I'd understand them and I'd be able to bring that food out there. I realize that's a fairy tale type thing, but illustrates well. What did God do to save our souls? What did this eternal spirit he became a man. And how many times do you say, fear not? That doesn't mean we lose our own respect for God. There's not that at all. It's trying to say, I'm your friend. I want you to be with me. Now, you sin. You chose to sin. You rebel. But I loved you anyway. And I've sent my son to die for you. And so Christ produces the love of God in human form. If in every point like we are yet without sin. The Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. A great physician. So he's able to do that. Now when you study about God, you go study about this. He's a personal being. So personal that the second person of the Godhead would become flesh. Let me give you some scriptures that help a little bit on understanding that God is personal. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Daniel chapter 4, verse 35. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. Again, Genesis 1, verse 26. Daniel 4, verse 35. And Ephesians 1, verse 11. So, he is not an impersonal force or a power. He's not just a concept or an idea. God is not the mere projection of man's thoughts. He is personal. He is a living spirit being. That's why we spent some time saying God is spirit. He is a personal being, but he's spirit. So, because he's personal, 
He has intelligence and volition and is capable of thinking and willing. Now, this uh, fact that he is active characterizes his existence, an existence which is not static, I guess we'd say, but it's active and alive. Now, we many times in saying we want to prove the existence of God, and we will talk about the first cause that was uncaused, and we talk about the prime mover that existed before anything else. That's good that we do that, but he's more than just that. He is a being, an eternal being. And he manifests the attributes of his nature derived from his essence. Now, because he's personal, we can know him as he reveals himself. A person, you, yourself, is really the only one that can truly reveal yourself to somebody else. Paul makes that kind of argument when he talks about how we got the scriptures. And he says that it's the Spirit of God that revealed the mind of God because the Spirit of God is God. Then he'll say, what man knoweth the mind of a man save the Spirit of man that's within him? So we need to understand that he's capable of communication because if you're personal, you communicate. And he's known then through the communication of Scripture. Thus, when I have a Bible, there it is. I don't know what God would have us do. It's in the Bible. It expects us to be honest with ourselves. We don't have to be. He expects us to do the necessary study as he gave us the wherewithal to learn that we might know his will. And that tests our love of him. And it tests our confidence and trust in him and his system of salvation that we learn about from his word. So we have the communication of the Holy Spirit, who is pictured as the revealer of the mind of God and confirmer of the word of God by the miracle signs and wonders, which he did. Now, I know that in a lesser degree, we can know God by the communication of, of nature. I understand that. But uh, we know that, as I say many times, you can contemplate a tree all day long and never learn the plan of salvation. Revelation has to give us the plan of salvation. Revelation has to give us the church and so on. So to be personal is to be characterized then by passion that we just already talked about. And that's a word on our level, but it's the way we have to talk about God. Um, I said in the beginning that we're limited by human language. We sing the song, um, where the soul of man shall never die. And that's the best way it can be communicated to us that our heavenly home, once we reach it, is a permanent place, the very presence of God, and death is long gone. I don't know how you can study what the Bible does say about deity, about his one divine essence, and not understand something about what our business is. I think now that I'll pause at this stage rather than go right up to the last few minutes, see if anybody has any questions.